the Palestinian Israel conflict has nothing to do with land. It's an existential battle. Palestinians are always the noble victims, the anti-Semitism on campus. That's the anti-Semitism that simply comes from faulty education. The anti-Semitism that comes from the Middle East is inherent to the doctrines of that faith. The Jew is tolerated in Islamic lands as long as he has the status of a dhimmi. Don't you dare ever criticize Islam. That's Islamophobic. Any land that has ever been occupied by Islam can never revert to anybody else. Anti-Israel protests have broken out across the world since Israel began pounding Gaza after Hamas's deadly attack on October 7th. Aggressive protests have taken place on campuses in the US and Canada. And at times they have become anti-Semitic. We spoke to Professor Gad Saad, who teaches in Canada's Concordia University on the protests and the Israel-Hamas war. He is the author of two bestsellers, The Parasitic Mind and The Saad Truth About Happiness. Why is there this deep-seated anti-Israel and anti-Semitic sentiments in academia and on campuses? So it's a, it's a complex question. So it, it depends who is the source of the uh, Jew hatred. Uh, there could be Islamic-based Jew hatred, which is one topic. There could be far-right Jew hatred, which is another group. There could be progressive leftist Jew hatred. That's a third group. So they may be coming at their Jew hatred from different positions, but at least they're all united in their common hatred of the Jew. And so it really depends. Now, in the context of university campuses, look, uh, much of uh, many of these disciplines that I discuss in the parasitic mind, you know, ethnic studies and peace studies and postmodernism and women's studies and intersectional feminism and all the rest of that stuff, they view the world through the eyes of the of a binary world of oppressed and oppressor. And therefore, and it's very not much not unlike how in Marxism you have the bourgeoisie and you have the proletariat, right? So the world is binary. There is the, the, the group on the right that's nice and the group on the left that's mean. And they have decided that the right message to send is that the uh, Palestinians are always the noble victims and the Zionist Nazi regime is always the oppressor and therefore every thing that is taught on university campuses in what's called near east studies programs or middle eastern programs is always viewed through the lens of you know until 1948 jews and muslims lived in perpetual loving peace in that area and then these really nasty guys from Europe that have absolutely no link to that land called Israel, absolutely none, came along and then they took over that land, stole it. And since they've been engaging in a 75 year genocide. Now, not, not a single syllable of that is true. But yet that is the message that it, that is promulgated in, on every campus. So it wouldn't be surprising then that if I am a product of those universities, if I'm a student that's come out of those universities, and that if that's the only message that I hear from my esteemed professors, then that's what I'm going to believe. So that would be one reason why you see the anti-Semitism on campus. That's the anti-Semitism that simply comes from faulty education. Okay, now the anti-Semitism that comes from uh, uh, the Middle East, that is inherent to the doctrines of that faith. In other words, people of that faith define their identity in part as a function of their existential hatred of the Jew. So if you have diabetes, it's the Jew who caused it. If your wife cheated on you, it's the Jew who put those thoughts in her head. If it's raining outside, it's the Jews that manipulate the weather. If your business has failed, it's probably some Jew that's in the background that has caused it to fail. Now, that's a very alluring 
psychological mechanism because we know that in psychology, when people are attributing successes and failure, this is called fu the fundamental attribution error. People tend to attribute successes internally. I did well on the exam because I'm smart and I studied hard. And they attribute failures externally. I did poorly on the exam because Professor Saad is a mean guy and he's unfair. Okay. Now, what a beautiful thing it is that I can attribute all of the failures, whether it be at the individual level or at the society level, to one key culprit. It's the diabolical scheming Jew. Now, you don't have to believe me. You can just go and do a content analysis of the doctrines within the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sirah, which is the biography of Muhammad. And then you can judge for yourself whether the message there is love the Jew or whether it is rid the world of the Jew. And then you can... Now, of course, that doesn't mean that every Muslim is a Jew hater. Uh, of course, most people of any faith are nice. There are nice Jews and mean Jews. There are nice Hindus and mean Hindus. There are nice Muslims and mean Muslims. But certainly, what does the religion preach? It's certainly not peaceful tolerance and coexistence with the Jew. The Jew is tolerated in Islamic lands as long as he has the status of a dhimmi. Dhimmi in Arabic is not even second-class citizen. It's third-class citizen. We tolerate you and you have to pay a jizya. Jizya is a tax of protection. And we tolerate you until the day we decide to no longer tolerate you. So for example, I am Lebanese. My mother tongue is Arabic. So people can certainly not argue that I don't know how to speak Arabic and I misunderstood the quote and I don't get it and so on. I grew up in the Middle East. We are Lebanese Jews. We were part of the last remaining groups of Jews in Lebanon. And then when the civil war broke out in the 70s, it was no longer possible to be Jewish in Lebanon and we had to leave under imminent threat of execution. My parents were kidnapped by Fatah, one of the PLO militia groups, and some really bad things were done to them. I'll give you a few other quick stories and then I'll cede back the floor to you. When I was five years old, and I talk about this in chapter one of The Parasitic Mind, when I talk about my personal history in Lebanon. When I was five years old, living in Lebanon, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser passed away. He was the Egyptian president who was a pan-Arabist. He was trying to unify the entire Arab world. He passed away. Now, I lived in Lebanon. It's the Egyptian president that died. Now, imagine my surprise as a five-year-old boy when I'm sitting on the balcony of my uh, house in Lebanon, in Beirut, and there is a huge demonstration of people because in, in, in the Middle East, there's always protests, right? The people are always protesting. And as the people were protesting, I was hearing death to Jews, death to Jews. And my mother said, hide, don't, don't show your, 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 your face on the back. Well, why are they chanting death to Jews when it is the Egyptian president who just died? What, does, what do the Jews have to do with that? Two quick other stories. Story number two, I'm about eight years old, and the teacher at my school says to the kids, okay, kids, I want you to stand up, and I want you to each say what you want to be when you grow up. So one person gets up, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a policeman, I want to be a soccer player. And one of the kids, who was a friend of mine, supposedly, with whom I played, gets up and says, when I grow up, I want to be a Jew killer. And everybody starts laughing and clapping. This is before the start of the civil war. This has nothing to do with the Zionist occupation. I have nothing to do with Israel. I'm Lebanese. I'm Arabic speaking. He didn't say, I want to kill Israelis. He said, I want to be a Jew killer, right? Story number three, when my family left Beirut International Airport, left Lebanon, to escape Lebanon, the airplane pilot announced that we had just cleared the airspace of Lebanon, at which point my mother takes out a pendant with the Star of David or like a chai, like a, a Israel, like a Jewish symbol, puts it around my uh, neck and says, now you can wear this proudly and no longer have to hide your identity. Now I'm going to fast forward to about 
10 days ago when my wife, along with one of our children, picked me up at a cafe where I was working on my laptop. He had, she had just picked him up from a soccer match in the east end of the city. And as I walked into the car, my son says to me, Daddy, if you had come to where I just played soccer, and if you were wearing a Star of David, you'd be dead. This is an 11-year-old. So 45 years ago, I leave Lebanon and my mother puts a pendant around my neck as an 11-year-old boy saying, now you can wear this proudly. 45 years later, my 11-year-old son, exactly the same age as that I was, tells me if you were wearing a Star of David in Montreal, Canada, you'd be dead. How has a political correctness on the part of leaders helped this anti-Semitic sentiments grow? Yes, it's a, it's a big question. So political correctness basically does the following. And so forgive me, I'm going to get a bit professorial here. Uh, there are two ethical state, uh, systems. There's what's called deontological ethics. Deontological ethics is when you make an absolute statement. So for example, if I say it is never okay to lie, that would be a deontological statement. On the other hand, consequentialist ethics is when you say it's okay to lie if I'm trying to spare someone's feelings. Okay. So for example, I always joke that if your spouse asks you, do I look fat in those jeans? then you better quickly put on your consequentialist hat and say, of course not, you look, you've never looked more beautiful if you want to have a happy long marriage. So for many, many things, it makes perfect sense for us to be consequentialist. And we are consequentialist, and that's fine. But there are some foundational universal principles that are deontological by definition. Freedom of speech, freedom of inquiry, presumption of innocence in the justice system. Those should never have, have, I believe in freedom of speech, but the second that you say, but then you're turning from a deontological position to a consequentialist position. Okay. Now, so now I'm going to link what I just said to your question about political correctness. So what often happens with Western leaders is that they apply a consequentialist ethos to something that should be deontological. So when you are a, a leader, you should speak the truth, even if it might hurt someone's feelings. So for example, many Western leaders say, don't criticize ever a particular religion because then that marginalizes people of that religion. But that only applies to that one religion. So you can go completely ape on criticizing Christianity, that makes you super progressive. And that makes you, that gives you a professorship at Columbia and at my alma mater at Cornell. So go ahead and make fun of Mormons, make fun of Christians, make fun of Catholics. That makes you an intellectual, but don't you dare ever criticize Islam. That's Islamophobic. And we don't want to be marginalizing. Look, Go ahead and criticize Judaism all you want. I don't care because I am strong enough in my identity to recognize that in a free society, people have a right to criticize any idea, any belief, any religion. You can't say, I believe in freedom of speech except X, Y, Z. And so I think what happens with Western leaders is in their desire to always appear infinitely compassionate and empath uh, you know and empathetic and nurturing they end up succumbing to political correctness but political correctness is akin to so now i'm going to give an example from my book in the parasitic mind so there is a wasp called the spider wasp that spider wasp it takes a spider that's much much bigger than it and it stings it, rendering the spider completely zombified. It's still alive, but it can no longer move. And it carries it to its burrow. It lays its eggs on it. And then when the offsprings hatch, the offspring will eat the spider in vivo while it's still alive. So I argue that political correctness is akin to the spider's st uh, spider wasp sting 
political correctness correctness stings me and i'm slowly led to the abyss of infinite lunacy quietly Shh, don't open your mouth and we can't have that in a free society in a free society yes of course we should always try to be nice to each other yes of course the default value is for every individual to be kind to to other individuals but that doesn't mean that we murder and rape truth in the service of protecting the feelings of someone you always speak the truth so that's why for example i say yes i believe that transgender people should live dignified lives free of bigotry that doesn't mean that in the service of that goal i need to agree with you that men too can menstruate and that men too can bear children i'm not going to murder truth in the service of a noble justice goal i can chew gum and walk at the same time i could be supportive of social goals while always being truthful while never violating a millimeter of the truth and i think unfortunately western leaders have succumbed to full consequentialism whereby they're willing to tell any lie as long as the consequences are that some group is never having hurt feelings what you tweeted recently connects absolutely to what we were discussing you said you're a very optimistic person i'm a fighter for western values and liberties i am a dogged defender of science reason and common sense i must say though that i am unsure that the west can recover from its multifront civilizational suicide and you have said that our kids will have to pay for uh, the progressive arrogance exactly so uh, and that that took i mean millions of people by surprise uh you know my tweet I, i don't know how many it's been viewed now millions and millions of times all over the world is because i think people are usually used to me being what uh, many people call me the happy warrior and hence why i wrote the happiness book which is even when i'm dealing with very complex difficult subjects i always seem to be you know playful and i can joke around and i can be fun and irreverent whereas here i was obviously very dire in my prognosis and and the reason for that is because i as i say in the in the full tweet and i highly uh, recommend that people go and read it it'll take them one minute to read it it's it's my pin tweet it's because you know if i draw an analogy if you go see your physician and he says hey mr dusk god forbid you have stage 4 cancer and here's what we need to do imagine if your answer is well there is no such thing as cancer and if there is cancer it's probably the fault of the jews and if they probably have the cure for it but they're holding it because the jews are diabolical and here's what i'm going to do to fight the cancer which i don't really have i'm going to smoke three packs of cigarettes a day i'm going to inhale a bag of asbestos and i'm going to uh suntan in an artificial suntan for the next 8 hours a day uh so as you know the adage the first step to solving a problem is to recognize that you have a problem right that's what you have for alcoholics well the west is not doing that right the west is saying la, 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 i don't want it. excuse me it is in a denial mode exactly it's in a complete denial mode and in the in the pursuit of that denial then you end up doubling down on all of the things that gave you stage 4 cancer right so right so i don't believe that smoking causes cancer even though you told me i have lung cancer as a matter of fact i'm going to smoke six packs a day to show you that that it's, there is no such thing as cancer and i don't have cancer and so that's why i was very uh solemn and pessimistic in that tweet because i saw look on october 7th 1400 plus israeli children young people holocaust survivors were butchered in the most horrific ways now three things can happen as a result of such a reality if you pursue the ontological principles of shared humanity you would be so there are three things that could happen globally right and before i explain that let me draw an analogy if you are on a diet 
every single day as a result of the set of decisions you make that day, three things can happen to your weight. There is no fourth thing. It's only three things. Either your weight at the end of that day goes up, either your weight stays exactly the same or your weight goes down. There is no other possibility, correct? Now let's apply that to October 7th, 1400 Jews were slaughtered in this most incredibly vicious, barbaric way. So three things can happen from the global community. There could be increased Jew hatred, there could be no change in Jew hatred, or there could be decreased Jew hatred. Well, you would think if 1400 Jews who were at a music festival were dancing around were slaughtered, then in a sane world, if only for the next few days, there would be decreased Jew hatred. But what has happened in the past three weeks? There has been massive demonstrations around the world of increased Jew hatred. As a result of 1,400 Jews being slaughtered, the greatest number of Jews killed in one day, if I understood correctly the stats, since the Holocaust. So that's why I wrote that tweet, because it's the perfect cocktail of unbelievably dangerous parasitic ideas and our will unwillingness to even start step one of addressing those parasitic ideas. As a matter of fact, we're doubling down on each of those dreadful ideas. And so I frankly don't have a good feeling for your grandchildren and mine, unfortunately. Coming back to one of the core questions, why does free Palestine you know, uh, see such overall support? But there's almost, you know, nil when it comes to Jews' right to coexist peacefully. Because a, 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 from the perspective of most Jew haters, a good Jew is one of two Jews. Either he sits, there's an expression in French, which I'll say it in French and then I'll translate, soit beau et tais-toi, which means be pretty, but stay quiet, right? So earlier, I mentioned what the dhimmi status is in Islamic lands. Anybody who is not Muslim, who is a kuffar, the people of the book, Ahl al-Katab, the Kutab, uh, meaning Christians, meaning Jews, could be tolerated under. Now, typically they're killed or they're forced to convert. But there is a third option. We could tolerate you as long as you live as a dhimmi, second, third class citizen, right? Well, for most Jew haters around the world, and as I explained earlier, they come of many forms. There are Jew haters on the progressive left. There is Jew haters on the ultra right. They come in many forms, but they're all united in their Jew hatred. Well, for those folks, Jews should always be quiet. We don't want Jews to be strong, right? So when you now have a confident Israeli nation, where that has personal agency that could defend itself. We can't tolerate that. That's not a good thing. Of course, we had Jews living in Arab lands, but they were in the minority. They kept quiet. We could at any moment decide that we were not going to tolerate them. By the way, Mr. Das, what's happened to Libyan Jews? Where are the Libyan Jews today? Where are the Algerian Jews? Where are the Yemeni Jews? Where are the Iraqi Jews? Where are the Egyptian Jews? Where are the Lebanese Jews? They all have seemed to have magically disappeared. The idea being that, of course, there are periods where Jews are tolerated, but they're tolerated until they're not tolerated, right? So it's kind of the analogy is you're walking around thinking you're perfectly healthy until you drop dead of a heart attack. Until the moment you drop dead of a heart attack, you were walking thinking that life is good and then boom, you're gone. So it's the same thing with the dhimmis in Islamic lands. You're tolerated until, inshallah, time comes and we no longer tolerate you. What's happened to all the Christian minorities in the Middle East? By the way, my homeland of Lebanon used to be the only Christian majority country in Lebanon. Oops, what happened now? And so the idea is that uh, uh, sure we can tolerate Jews, but not when they are in a position of power. And so the existence of Israel is an existential threat to that theological position. 
right? There's another position that your viewers should know. In in Islam, the world is divided into two worlds, Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Harab, the house of Islam and the house of war. Any land that has ever been occupied by Islam can never revert to anybody else. That's why, for example, Andalusia, which is in current Spain, at one point was conquered by Islam. Well, you often hear Islamists say, inshallah, we will get back Andalusia because this is our land. Once it becomes in Dar al-Islam, it can't go back to, and everything else is Dar al-Harab, the house of war. We need to conquer it. So, but of course, most of the people who walk around at Columbia and Cornell and go free, free Palestine don't know all these things. They simply view the world as Palestinians are the victims, are the oppressed, the Jews are the mean oppressors, and it ends there as a member of the LGBT community. Okay, great. More power to you. Now, if you if that's your foundational identity, which society should you be supporting more? Tel Aviv? which is one of the most queer-friendly societies, or Gaza, where you will be thrown off a building within three seconds of you entering Gaza. But no, queers for Palestine. So this is what I also, by the way, there was a woman recently, you may have seen her. Her name is Anna Epstein, Jewish Anna Epstein. She was going around Boston University, pulling down the posters of kidnapped Jewish babies. She's Jewish. How long would she survive? What would have happened to her if she was in Southern Israel at that music festival? She would be raped, then decapitated, but she was for Palestine. So this is what I call, so there is one example of a parasitic situation. There is a wood cricket. The cricket despises water. It never wants to go on water. But when the wood cricket is parasitized by a, hair worm, then the cricket suicidally jumps in the water to its death. It drowns. But it needs to do that from the hair worm's perspective, because in order for the hair worm, the parasite, to complete its reproductive uh, cycle, the cricket has to jump in water. So it alters its brain circuitry so that the cricket is willing to happily commit suicide into the water. There is your chickens for Kentucky Fried Chicken. There is your Jews for Palestine. There is your queers for Palestine. They say they are against colonialism. They're against imperialism. They're against military conquest. Okay, fair enough. Now, we can argue and debate whether uh, the existence of Israel for the past 75 years constitutes a military colonization, but okay. Let's suppose we can see that that's true, just for the argument's sake. So then I wrote and I said, hey, everybody, I'm wondering, does anybody know how the 57 countries that constitute the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, how did Islam become the majority in all of those societies? Was it by passing around candy and sweets? And by engaging in the in reason debate and the Socratic method, because if you are against violent military conquests, and if you are against colonialism and imperialism, okay, great. But then you have to be consistent. And so then I said, hey, are there any historical evidence, let's say in India, where there is a phenomenal amount of people that died under Islamic invasion. And most people say, what? Never heard of that. Don't know what you're talking about. Don't know. Never, never, ever heard of that. Most people are cognitively lazy, are intellectually lazy. So whatever I learned in my uh, uh, Near East Studies course at Columbia is what I'm going to repeat when I go to the Free Free Palestine demonstration. And what I learned in that course is that the Jews are mean, apartheid, Nazi-like country engaging in a daily genocide. By the way, uh, maybe I need to refresh my mathematics, even though I have many degrees in mathematics, because I didn't know that in a genocide, 
a population can increase fivefold because from about 1960 to currently, there is about a fivefold increase in the Palestinian population from roughly 1 million to 5 million. So those pesky Jews are very good in science and philosophy and, and art and music, but clearly they really suck at, at committing genocide because it's the only instance in history where a population that's being supposedly exterminated has increased fivefold. So maybe somebody could explain that to me because I must have missed that class in uh, at Columbia University. Is there a resolution of this conflict? The Palestinian-Israel conflict has nothing to do with land. Nothing, zero, not one inch to do with land. It's an existential battle. Does one group accept the fact that there is going to be a Jewish presence in the Middle East where there is a Jewish nation that exists with full autonomy, with a Jewish majority presence? Is one group going to get rid of its theological doctrines that you're taught from day zero of your birth that the Jew is the usurper, the Jew is the is the diabolical. Now, of course, again, that doesn't mean that all people of that faith believe that. And of course, most people ignore all that stuff. But I can send you all the quotes. You can just go Google them yourself. You can do a search from a million imams in every single mosque you could think of, where part of the prayers is about the eradication of the Jew. So um, if that is removed, if there is a way where there could be a, a reformation, I'm not very optimistic, where all of those passages become null and void, where we no longer demonize the Jew as the source of all of our problems, then I think down the line there could be peace. And I can tell you, the amount of human potential in the Middle East is infinite. We have such huge cultural traditions. Now I'm speaking about everybody, the the the, the Christian Arab, the, the Muslim Arab, the, the 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 Jews from Arabic countries. We all share a deep love of hospitality, of food, of culture. We have great linguistic heritage, historical heritage. If we could resolve this tribal mindset of us versus them, this existential mindset set of Jew hatred, we would unlock the richness of the Middle East that would make the richness of oil be nothing compared to the cultural richness. So the problem between Israel and Palestine ultimately is not one of land. It's one where you have to accept the fact that it is fair that there are nearly 2 billion Muslims that live on earth. There's 15 million Jews that live. They're outnumbered 125 to 1. 99.6% of the land surrounding Israel is Arab Muslim land. 0.4% of the land is Israel. That seems like a pretty fair deal. Once people accept that, then we could move on and live in universal brotherhood. After a remark, of your tweet where you said that you will be interviewed by India Today. So in the chain of comments that I was seeing, there's someone who mentions, and here I quote that person, nobody hates Jews. That is just a spin. People hate injustice, manipulation, and the chaos that has occurred with Zionism. Hating Zionism isn't hating Jews. If you don't hate the real issue, you are part of the problem, you're I mean, I want your comments on that. Yes. Well, that's why I wrote the tweet that's pinned on my Twitter feed, because that tweet that you just read is exactly the problem, which is there is no intellectual decency. So let me address it very directly. There is 1,400 years of documented Jew hatred that precedes the existence of, quote, Zionism. How do you explain that? The Grand Mufti of Jerusalem got together with Hitler. Hitler seemed to hate the Jews and had nothing to do with Zionism, because by definition, if we know history, 
Hitler existed before Israel as a country existed, right? And yet he wanted to get rid of the Jewish parasites that are a problem in, 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 in Germany, yes? So the idea that nobody hates the Jews might be the greatest lie ever told because I mean, history is laden with a million examples of Jewish exterminations. All those are due to Zionism. So when the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem got together with Hitler before the existence of Israel, and he said, don't worry, once we're done with the Jews in Europe, we will exterminate the Jews, inshallah, in Palestine. What did that have to do with Zionism, right? So it is so laughably incorrect. Now, some people may not know this. They could be simply ignorant. But the reality is most people who say, no, 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 I just hate Zionists. I love the Jews. They're typically Jew haters. Now, that doesn't mean, by the way, that people can't appropriately criticize specific Israeli policies. If you criticize some policy of Israel that doesn't make you a Jew hater. That's perfectly up for, as a matter of fact, as you know, there is a huge segment of Israeli population that they will themselves criticize the Israeli government, that they will themselves criticize Netanyahu. Nobody's even saying, I'm the first guy to say, criticize Judaism as much as you want. That's perfectly fine. You have but been retreating you- this over and over again, I know this stand of yours, uh, that policies are welcome, you can criticize, but you know, the hatred part is very, very diff- different. Exactly. Don't, Professors- don't walk down and say, gas the Jews. What is, you, you're not saying I'm against Zionism because X, Y, Z. You're saying gas the Jews. How could that not be hatred? What would be hatred then? If, if chanting gas the Jews is not hatred, Give me an example of what hatred is, right? So so that's nonsense. It's garbage. No one should take such stupidity seriously. Why did I escape Lebanon? Why did I put on running shoes and run really fast so that my head would not be detached from the rest of my body? I had nothing to do with Zionism. I was an 11-year-old child. Imagine this, Mr. Das. Imagine my wife sitting with me at a cafe. This happened about two weeks ago when this the, the crazy anti-Semitic stuff. Outside my university, there were huge chants of very ugly anti-Semitic stuff. How do you think I feel trying to go through my office when there is this kind of chanting going on? So she said to me, Gad, where are we going to go next? Where are we going to run to next? So imagine... In the 21st century, that the wife of a professor who preaches freedom of speech, freedom of inquiry, love of science, love of reason, we're having a conversation. Where are we going to run to next? Well, if nothing else, at least we could run to Israel. Maybe there we will be safe. But as we found out on October 7th, even there, you may not be safe if you're having fun at a music festival. So the reason why, look, there's many forms of hatred. In, in the world. So I'm hardly saying that Jew hatred and, and anti-Jew bigotry is the only form of hatred, but it's a unique form of hatred because it is the longest standing hatred and it is the most stained form of hatred because it's diabolical. So for example, I will if, if I showed you the kind of hate that I've received over the past three weeks, and you never see me posting stuff where I say, you know, I'm attacking individual Muslims or that. I always try to keep it professorial. I always try to criticize ideas, right? But if I showed you the kind of thing, I am a parasite, I am a dog, I am a lying Jew, I'm a criminal, I'm a murderer, I'm a supporter of genocide of children. They're saying this to me, the guy whose house in Beirut was stolen by Palestinians. And yet I don't hold any hatred towards Palestinians. The way I decided to take revenge is to live my life with dignity and honor. I don't hate Palestinians, right? I judge people by the totality of their merits and their flaws. I don't present myself to the world as Gad, part of the Jewish people. I present myself as Gad Saad. I would love to 
you know, hear about your happiness book. I wrote the happiness book because I, 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 if you were to ask me three years ago, if I'm going to write a happiness book, I would have never told you so, but I kept receiving a, a million emails from people saying, what's your secret to always being fun and playful. And so I thought, okay, well, why don't I try to give those secrets? And so I decided to write a book, which was made up of three parts, my personal experiences, what makes me happy? Why, you know, what are the decisions that I've made in my life that have led to me being happy? Coupled with ancient wisdoms, what have ancient philosophers told us about how to live the good life? And backed up by contemporary science, neuroscience, positive psychology, happiness studies. And so I put those together and I offer hopefully a prescription to how to lead the good life. Maybe I could give you, a, since we only have about four minutes, a few of the secrets. I argue in the book, early on in the book, that there are two decisions that you can make that either will grant you great happiness or great misery, choosing the right spouse and choosing the right profession. Profession, uh, Choosing the right spouse, there are two opposing maxims in evolutionary psychology, either the birds of a feather flock together or the opposites attract. Well, the research shows that it's overwhelmingly birds of a feather flock together. If you wanna have a successful marriage, Marry someone who shares your fundamental values, your fundamental belief systems. That's going to much more increase your chances of being happy. In terms of your job that's going to give you maximal happiness, I argue that there are two elements to that. If you have a job that allows you to pursue your creative impulse, you could be a chef, you could be an architect, you could be an author, you could be a stand-up comedian. All of these professions are very different, but they allow me to create something new and that provides me great purpose and meaning and the other thing i would say related to occupational happiness is any job that gives me temporal freedom that allows me to float around from one thing to another where i am not bound if i am a bus driver i know that my fate is sealed from nine o'clock to five o'clock there is no ability to move around i also talk about live your life so that you don't have regrets later in life live your life as though life is a playground. So even when I'm pursuing my science, it's a big form of play. You're trying to find which variables correlate or cause other variables. Science is nothing but a big puzzle making exercise, right? Puzzle solving exercise. And so I go through all of these different prescriptions of how to live a good life. I hope that people will read it. Certainly given all of the very serious things that we've talked about on, on this show, we all need some happiness in our lives. Thanks a lot for uh, your time. Uh, it has been an amazing uh, interact uh, interacting with you. Uh, take care and hope we get you uh, in our studio when you are visiting India. I hope so too. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And Thanks I'll a lot. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Cheers. Take Thank care. You.